In this screencast, we're going to look at the numerous skin appendages or accessory organs as a part of the integumentary system and the skin. Um, so in general, we're going to look at the, um, and mention the glands, um, which of, there are two types, and we'll get to those later, um, hair, hair follicles, nails, along with some other structures. In the screen, so the first type of gland here is what's called an oil gland or a sebaceous gland. Um, again, you can look up your word parts, but oil glands um, produce a particular type of oil in the skin. They're called it's called sebum, and it has uh, these three pretty important pretty important functions uh, for the skin. Um, most of these oil glands they are activated in humans at puberty, and um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but sometimes they're they kind of way overactive and produce some oily skin. If they aren't active enough, we have a condition called dry skin. So just a look, of, look at them in a kind of a cartoon drawing, as I call it, a sebaceous gland. They're typically, usually open to hair follicles, and here you can take a look at the, um, the oil gland itself in an actual photomicrograph. Another type of gland are called the sweat glands, or pseudoiferous glands. But sweat glands, um, they obviously produce the, the sweat. And as you'll find out in lab, they're widely distributed in the skin, but um, per their location, it really determines um, how numerous they are. There's two types of pseudoiferous glands, or sweat glands. One, the most common, the typical sweat gland, is called the eccrine gland. Um, this gland is open, open to the surface of the skin. Uh, it produces the typical sweat substance that we're talking about. Apricot glands um, aren't quite as numerous. These things enter into the hair follicles. Um, they aren't even active until puberty, but the, um, the sweat is just a little bit more of a, of a fatty, thicker consistency to it. Um, and we don't need to deter. We don't need to determine or distinguish between them, uh, really, other than just to note there's two different types. We won't go into a lot of detail with its composition either. You can read through the composition of sweat. Um, know that it's mostly water. For the most part, the biggest thing for sweat for humans is is to dissipate heat. Um, it's an evaporated process. That's a cooling process as the water evaporates from the surface of the skin. Um, you probably know from chemistry that that's a cooling process. Um, but it does help us get rid of some urea products, some waste products, and it is acidic in nature. It does inhibit bacterial growth. Um, it's kind of a myth that sweat has a real strong odor. Um, it's the bacteria that actually feed their, their metabolism. They feed on the waste products that are in the sweat, and therefore that's where you'd get an odor. That's where you would get in a, a body odor. A little bit about hair. Uh, obviously produced in the hair follicle, which you should be able to identify. And it just has specially keratinized epithelial cells. That's what hair is from. So it's actually typically from products of cells. Uh, the melanocytes, again, depending on genetics, um, for the most part, are what provide pigment for the color of the hair. You've got... You've got probably genes, um, maybe up to a dozen or more genes that actually contribute to your hair color. A couple other structures to be familiar with. Um, again, the follicle, the hair follicle, uh, that's essentially the part of the hair that houses the hair root, or it's the shaft or the, or the uh, depression that holds the hair root. The erector pili muscle is pretty important. Pretty important. Um, this is what actually pulls hairs upright when cold or frightened. And when it pulls the hair upright, it actually produces a little bump on the skin. Kind of like if you were piling up, when you push snow, you pile it up. And you kind of pile up the, the skin. And that is goosebumps. Um, of course, if you're from Minnesota, not duck bumps, goosebumps. Nails, fingernails, and toenails are another kind of modifying or modification of the epidermis, um, even more keratinized than your skin, or sorry, that your, your hair would be. 
the stratum or stratum basale extends underneath this nail bed, and that is, again, what is responsible for the growth. So the nails, there is no pigment, there aren't any melanocytes there, therefore your nails are actually colorless until you do something about it. So you should be able to identify these. You'll identify these structures in the lab as well. Take a picture of your own nail and be able to identify them and match them with the pictures that you'll see next.